Hi everybody, we're going to go over the newspaper chapter while we're sitting in my kitchen. Okay, here we go. You know, newspapers have actually been around forever. There were newspapers in Caesar's time in Rome. It was called the Actu Ditura, I think. Anyway, it was on stone. So if you ever had a paper route when you were younger, be grateful that you didn't have a paper route during Caesar's time because it would have made you very tired. The first colonial paper actually it was only run one time. It was called Public Occurrences, Foreign and Domestic, and it was on one sheet of paper with printing on one side and it only ran once. The Boston News Letter came out in 1704, but the news from Europe was old, of course, because it took two weeks for the news to come over from Europe by boat. What I think is most interesting about this newspaper is that it included lists of public floggings and illnesses. And I gotta tell you, I think a newspaper like that would totally do well today. Think about it. Actually, I think that's kind of what they do now. <laughs> Many scholars consider the Pennsylvania Gazette started by Ben Franklin to be the best colonial paper. He was actually the first person to realize that he could make a lot of money selling advertising space in his paper. Of course, is there anything that Ben Franklin couldn't do? So by 1765, 30 newspapers operated in the colonies. And that's huge considering how small we were and how small our population was. They were mainly partisan papers, meaning they were political, or they were commercial papers, meaning that they just existed to sell ads and make money. But the biggest paper only had a circulation of 1,500. So why was that? Well, primarily it was because the infrastructure to deliver newspapers didn't really exist then. You know, how could you get a newspaper out to 5,000 different people in that time in history? It had been very, very difficult. So that's why circulation was low then. Once you started using cheaper paper and the literacy rate started increasing, ended up with something called penny papers. The New York sign was really the first one. Lots of scandal, lots of celebrity news. Guess how much the pennies, pa penny papers cost? Huh? A penny, yeah, you guys are smart. One thing that the Sun was the first to do is include serial stories. So it would start a story in one paper and then continue it the next day. So you had to continually buy the paper to read the story, which is brilliant. Brilliant. So because of the Sun's success, other papers started leaning towards more human interest stories, which is in the industry referred to as soft news. Soft news are features, hard news are facts. We'll get to more of that in a second. All right, so I know you all have heard of the Associated Press. That's a wire service. There used to be two specific wire services in the United States, uh, United Press International and Associated Press. UPI went out of business not too long ago. So AP is the wire service in the United States. Reuters is the wire service in Europe. Here's what a wire service does. It groups reporters together to share stories with multiple newspapers. So actually this happened, this started during the Civil War. Instead of the six newspapers in New York at the time sending six reporters to the Civil War or to cover battles, they would send one. And then that reporter would share the stories with all six newspapers. That was a co-op, okay? And that's how the Associated Press got started. UPI actually started with um, carrier pigeons which I think is fascinating. So wire services are actually really smart because the Post-Dispatch, for example, doesn't have reporters in the Middle East, right? But since they are a member of Associated Press, they can get AP stories from the Middle East and run them in their newspaper. So that's a plus, that's a pro. The cons of being part of a wire service is that there's really no originality. Um, and you know what, if the Associated Press story is biased, then you're running a biased story, even though you didn't write it. There's not a lot of local investigative journalism anymore because it's much cheaper to pay for Associated Press stories than it is to pay for a reporter to go out and dig up dirt. So a lot of times the Post-Dispatch will be filled with nothing but Associated Press stories. So there you go, pluses and minuses, wire service. You might have heard of the term yellow journalism. Basically, this was in the late 1800s, and it's sex, crime, disasters, big headlines. And you know what? It's not that different from the way the news is today. 
But investigative journalism started during this time, and that's when you had reporters like Nellie Bly going out, um, lying about her mental condition so she can be admitted into a mental institution and write stories about what that, was like, what that experience was like. Yellow journalism, um, you're going to also hear of it referred to as muckrakers. That's what Teddy Roosevelt called them. Uh, William Randolph Hearst was big during this time. It's a popular term. Okay, Joseph Pulitzer is mentioned in your book for a couple of reasons. He bought the St. Louis Post, merged it with the St. Louis Dispatch, and came up with the St. Louis Post Dispatch. The Post Dispatch is traditionally a Democratic leaning newspaper, and it also used to be published in the afternoon, and the Globe Democrat was published in the morning. The Globe Democrat was more of a conservative newspaper. Well, the Globe went out of business, the Post Dispatch moved to the morning, and now the Post is. is the only mainstream newspaper in St. Louis. Most cities in the country now only have one newspaper. New York has two, Chicago has two or three. The problem with only having one newspaper is that we are only given that viewpoint. There's no competing point of view. And it's, it's a shame, really, because we, we don't have options. Well, we do now because of the internet. Something interesting that Joseph Pulitzer did was that he was the first to target women with his newspaper, which meant that he included um, fashion, fashion news, advice columns, thank you, That's okay. fashion news, advice columns, um, horoscopes, recipes, all of that stuff. And that was how he was trying to target women. He also included department store advertising. And even now, the largest advertiser of the Post-Dispatch is Macy's. I know you've heard of William Randolph Hearst. He was the, um, the inspiration behind um, <laughs> the movie I made my kids watch that they hated. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Citizen Kane. I told my kids it was one of the best movies ever, and they hated it. Not enough explosions, I guess. So here's what William Randolph Hearst said about journalism. He says, you don't want facts, you want novelty. So that means you want new stuff. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You just want something new that people haven't read before. And that's how he sold his newspapers. His empire led to something called consolidation of ownership. And basically what that means is that instead of every newspaper being owned by its own company, now there are really only five or six newspaper companies in America that own every newspaper. So what? Why is that a bad thing? Well, if you are a huge corporation and you are selling news, do you want to give people what they want or what they need? You want to give them what they want. So are citizens getting enough information to make intelligent voting decisions when their news sources are owned by profit-based, privately held corporations? Nope. No. And consolidation of ownership is not just a problem in newspapers. It's a problem in media in general, which we'll talk about later in the semester. But I want you to be aware that newspapers are a business, first and foremost. Their goal is to sell newspapers, not to inform you. Make sure you remember that. There are two national papers in the United States, Wall Street Journal and the USA Today. Ironically, these are the only two newspapers that have an increase in circulation. Crazy, huh? The USA Today, when it first came out in 1982, was criticized heavily for the use of too many photos, too much color, charts and graphs, and that the stories were really short. It was referred to as Mick Paper, meaning that um, the critics of the USA Today thought that, that they were dumbing down news. Now, typically, USA Today is only sold at McDonald's and you get one outside your hotel room door. I don't think many people actually subscribe to the USA Today, but loads do to the Wall Street Journal. Um, we do actually. We stopped our Post-Dispatch subscription a couple years ago, and now we only exclusively get the Wall Street Journal. Your book talks about ethnic press. What that is is non-mainstream newspapers. So in St. Louis, there's the St. Louis American, which serves the African-American community. And there's also a startup newspaper that is attempting to serve the Bosnian community in St. Louis. Alternative press is the term for independently run newspapers who are a little 
edgy. And the Riverfront Times is a perfect example for that in St. Louis. And I know you all probably know more. You can tell me when we get to class. Hyper-commercialism is a criticism of the news because its focus now is on selling ads. So much so that now main newspapers have ads on the front page. You might not think that that's such a big deal, but the front page of a major newspaper is prime, revered journalism real estate. And they've sold it to the highest bidder. So newspapers selling ads on the front page have basically just admitted that they're in it for the money. That's kind of sad. Kind of sad. See, I'm being biased. Okay, two terms. You know you're familiar with the term circulation. That basically just means the number of copies sold. What your book suggests it should be is a term called integrated audience reach, which includes circulation plus the online readership. Now, I'm going to say that the newspaper industry made a horrible mistake when they started putting their information online for free. The first newspaper went online in 1982, and they did not have a paywall. So in our minds, then, news is free online. So if news is free online, why should we subscribe to a newspaper? Why should we buy a newspaper? Good question, right? A lot of the older people use a newspaper just as a part of their morning routine. It's a habit. They like to hold it in their hands. Your generation doesn't care. And so many people have suspected that the newspaper will cease to exist around 2039 in its dead tree form. Okay, some criticisms of newspapers is there's too much soft news, meaning that there's too many feature stories, not a lot of hard news. There's a reason for this. Think of it this way. By the time a newspaper hits your driveway at 7 in the morning, that news is already 8, 9 hours old. Because the newspapers are put to bed, is what, what it's described, put to bed around 10 o'clock at night. Then they're printed and delivered while we sleep. Compare that to Twitter. How old is breaking news on Twitter? Mm, not old at all. It's immediate. We are used to immediate news. Well, newspapers cannot provide immediate news, so they focus on feature stories. They might not tell us everything about an earthquake in China, but they might tell us about what everyone is doing with the, with the homeless dogs, Tr dogs trying to find their owners, that sort of thing. OK, you follow? Another big criticism of newspapers is that they take play, um, they try to set an agenda for the community and that they're really biased and push for certain political issues. And that's a no-brainer. Everybody can agree to that. The fact that newspapers actually endorse political candidates, I think, is shameful. Really. I, they ought to trust us to be able to make our own decisions. But that's the, that's the libertarian in me coming out. <laughs> All right, you want to know who Adolf Fox is? He bought the New York Times in 1896. He wanted to focus on hard news, not the celebrity stuff, not the drama, not the crime. News, okay? And how he did that was using something called the inverted pyramid of writing. Now, if you've taken a media writing class, you've heard this term before. You start with the most important facts and then add the details as you go down the story. Ox thought that his reporters, if they used an inverted pyramid writing format, would be able to keep their writing from being too biased. Eh, we'll leave that up to the historians, but I think it was a very noble cause. Walter Lippmann had a different idea. He wrote a great book in the 1920s uh, called Public Opinion. The name escaped me just for a second, and I had to read that book in grad school. What he said the role of the press should be to analyze current situations and suggest plans. So Lippmann had a completely different idea than Adolf Fox. Lippmann thought that newspapers should find social problems and attempt to fix them rather than just report the news. So they had a very different viewpoint of the role of the news. OK, that's the highlight from the newspaper chapter. So make sure to jot down any questions you might have, and we'll talk more when we get to class, all right? Thanks for hanging out with me in my kitchen this morning.